last Wednesday night, I opened up this series and, and the title of the sermon was, you are the one that will reach the one, or you're the one that's going to reach the ones. And last week we covered the, the condition of those who are lost. And I want to dive a little bit deeper into the condition of those that we're reaching, because if we don't do it, it's just not going to happen. Soon, pretty soon, we're going to be going into Easter and Easter is going to be one of our biggest it's the biggest celebration all year long of what Christ has done for us. But also Easter is going to be our biggest day to seeing, to seeing our friends and family members hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And many of them are going to make a decision to be saved, to place their faith in Jesus. It's going to be a miracle Sunday. But until that day, we got some work to do. Say it with me. We have some work to do. Now, God's given us some instructions, and this year, we're going to add 3,000 new families to our church. Say with me, 3,000 new families to our church. And how are we going to do that? Well, God not only gives vision, he gives a plan. So on Easter, we got around, around two and a half months. April 4th is Easter, and we want that to be a big, big day for heaven. And it's going to be a big, big day for heaven as we all do our part. And this is our part. This is all we're going to do. Everyone bring one family. Say with me. Everyone bring one family. So you, got, you have right now from here all the way to Easter to get one family to come with you. Now, once you get that family, this, we're going to go even the extra mile. From here on out, starting especially next week. From here on out, this is what I want you to do online and here. This is what I want you to do is if you, when a family commits, yes, I'm going to go to Easter with you. If you can, you could do this as well. Go the extra mile. Take a picture of them. And, and I want you to put it on your social media, um, on Instagram or Facebook or send it to us. And, and just hashtag it. Hashtag the way Easter 2021. Hashtag the way Easter 2021. This is what we're going to do. As we're getting these pictures of these families, every Sunday, we're going to post them up here in the big screen. And we're going to see eventually thousands of families up there every single Sunday. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray for them every single Sunday until they get here. How many believe that's a good idea? So instruction number one, everyone bring one family for Easter 2021. The second thing we're going to be doing is right after Easter, we are moving into uh, our, a, a big, big, huge time of the year. Right after Easter, we're going to bridge them into our marriage challenge 2021. And this is what we do. We work on relationship skills for four weeks straight. Our goal is to have 3,000, well, actually, 2,000 couples that commit, commit to um, working on their relationships for four weeks straight. You might be single and say, I want to, do I, what, do, I mean, do I participate in that? Matter of fact, the book that we're reading in those four weeks is called Laugh Your Way Into a Better Marriage. And it starts off addressing singles and it starts mentioning things like this. Is there a certain thing as a soulmate? And the reason he discusses that, because so many times we think there's this perfect somebody out there for me. And I'm not saying there isn't a perfect somebody out there for you. But if you think, if you really focus on soulmates, you might miss it. Because if you do marry someone and it doesn't work out, you'll say, that wasn't my soulmate. But the idea is there's laws and principles of God that if we apply them, we can have great relationships. And if relationships are not working, is someone is breaking the rules. So we're going to learn about the laws to make marriage work. And this is going to be awesome. In those four weeks, the author of the book is going to be here and teach one of our sessions. And he usually, when he teaches those sessions... Um, he does a weekend seminar. Those seminars cost from $500 to $1,200 for a weekend. And you're going to be able to enjoy all of that really for free. The material is going to cost $25. We're going to have limited, limited material. So you want to sign up next Sunday. We're going to make it available for you to sign up. 
invite your friends. You could even sponsor them. Say, don't you worry about it. I'll cover your 25 and I'll lock in your packet. How many believe that we could get these two things done for the Lord? Everybody bring one family and everyone sign up one couple, right? It could be the same couple that you bring on Easter. So now we're setting all that up because we're realizing that God is saying, you're the ones that are going to fulfill this vision. I'm going to do it through you. But I want you to understand the condition that they're in if you do nothing about it. Today we're going to talk about the condition of a human soul apart from God. But let's look at this in Isaiah, I mean, I'm sorry, in Judges chapter 6. And it says this, verse 1. It says, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The first thing we see here is a group of people called the Israelites. And that word Israelites means, it's, the definition is God prevails. Say it with me, God prevails. So God had a plan for these people. Um, he never had a plan for them to be dominated by anything, by any drug, by any group of people but that they would prevail over every challenge, that they would be victorious. And all it's saying is, with God, you're victorious. That was their name. That was God's plan for their lives. But there was a, something that happened that instead of them prevailing, they started losing. They started being defeated. They started being dominated. What happened? The Bible says that they did, they did evil in the Lord's sight. They did wrong in the Lord's sight. Now, everything that we do, I want you to get this, God sees. We're pretty good at hiding stuff from our friends, our families, um, our, our wives, our husbands. But while you're trying to hide it, understand this, God sees it. And then one day, yes, one day we'll be held accountable to it. But this was a condition of these people. They did evil in the Lord's sight. And all it means is this, they were sinners. That's all it means. Now, when we're talking about reaching people that are sinners, I want you to know this and I want to remind you of this. They're sinners, but we were sinners. And what I mean by that is every single person has done evil in the Lord's sight. And why am I saying that? I never want you to forget where you came from and never get to a point that you're judgmental or critical of people that were in the same place that you were in. How many understand that? You cannot be really good at reaching one when you're focusing on judging one. We can only be good at reaching one when we remember that we were the one and someone had enough mercy to look past our attitude to look past our addiction, to look past our nasty, come on, our nasty ways and say, you know what? God did it for me and I love you and God will do it for you. We got too many people that forgot that they did evil in the Lord's sight, that they were sinners and now they can't reach a sinner because they don't have the love and the compassion to reach them. Look what the Bible says about our condition before we judge anybody else. In Romans 3.23 it says this, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. So who sinned? Who sinned? Everybody. So there's nobody here that could say, you know, I never sinned. The Bible says, if you say you never sinned, this is what God says about you, liar. The Bible says you're a liar and the truth is not in you. So we have to understand that, yes, God redeemed us, but don't let the redemption and the freedom and the love and the forgiveness that God gave you turn into pride in any way. How can we reach sinners if we're judging them? See, Jesus, I want just about judging for a minute. This is the condition of those that we're reaching. They did evil in the Lord's sight. And, and when Jesus, when God looks at evil in the Lord's sight, right now, he does not want to judge it he wants to save sinners. Right now, God wants to show mercy, not judgment. 
He doesn't want to criticize the hurting and the broken and those that are in bondage. He wants to save them. We are on a rescue mission with the mercy and love of God. Let's make sure we're representing God or Jesus properly. We're going to reach them, but we're going to reach them with the right spirit. Jesus did not come to just sinners, but to save them. And I want you to think about this. God sees it all, and he's not intimidated by our sins, our failures, or immorality. Yesterday, I, I, like, I like looking at cars. Any little break I get, I study the word, go look at cars. No. And there's a car I'm looking at right now that I love, and I read up on it and study it and look at the pictures and sideswipe it to, to you know, save the picture and all that. It's the new Corvette C8. The new Corvette C8 is a beautiful car. Mid-engine, 495 horsepower. It goes zero to 60 in 2.9 seconds. The Z06 is coming out pretty soon, and that's even going to be faster, and I want all of them. <laughs> They're hard to find right now. If you want to buy a C8 Corvette, you're probably going to pay around $20,000 over MSRP. Even the used ones. So I, I, there's one, I found one. Just to go look at, I'm not buying one right now, but I found one in, in Upland at CNC and they have all kinds of exotic cars and I walk in and they have a Corvette sitting on the showroom floor, a C8 Corvette. I took Gabriel because I'm, he's my disciple, so I got to take him, teach him all this stuff. <laughs> now who comes out, um, I meet a guy I've never seen there, but I've been there before and he comes out and he says, I'm the new owner of this dealership. He goes, I just came in and we're just, and I just want to talk to a few customers, just get a feel of what's going on here. So I'm talking to him and I start sharing. He goes, what do you do for them? I go, I'm a pastor. And I go, do you go to church? And he, oh, he goes, so, oh, wow. He starts talking. But in the middle of his conversation, there's F words and there's a lot of, it's just a lot of cussing, this, that. And I said, pastor, how do you handle that? I could handle that. I'm not intimidated by that. It doesn't freak me out. I'm here to reach a sinner. I got to look past all that stuff to reach. I'm not going to say, hey, can you please just tone down your little cousin? <laughs> That's like you trying to, I mean, you're trying to, to, to uh, I don't even know what you call it. You're trying to, how do you clean a fish before you caught it? We're not here to curtail people's behavior. We're here to reach them so they could be saved. They could be born again. We got to be able to be comfortable to reach a sinner right where they're at and not be so, in, oh my gosh, what are you saying? You're dirtying me. They're not dirtying you. You're cleansing them by you being there. Show them some love. Show them love first. Convince them of a Savior that loves them so you could reach them. Gabriel's hearing the guy cussing the whole time. He's just looking at me. How I respond. I'm like, oh, good. It doesn't matter. I'm going to reach that guy. I got his number. He told me already I'm going to come to church. I go, good. He has a reality TV show. He's getting ready to launch out. You know, he's a multimillionaire young man. I go, we're going to reach that young man. JD's his name. So when JD comes, you guys know, I told you JD's coming. But in order to reach JD, I didn't make sure that I wasn't judgmental of JD because JD would feel it. So these people that did evil in the Lord's sight, this story is not to highlight their evil. This story is to highlight the mercy and the grace of God, how God saved a group of people that did evil. Maybe we got this all wrong and we're sending a message that people need to fix themselves before they come to God. And the idea is you can't fix yourself before you come to God. You come to God and God fixes you. I've heard people say, oh man, I'm not going to church. I got to get some stuff together, bro. That's like you saying, I got to get healed before I go to the doctor. No, you go to the doctor, man. You're getting really bad. Right? Just go to the doctor. 
come to church. This is a place where you're going to be loved right where you're at. Now, we're not loving you right where you're at so you stay where you're at. We love you right where you're at so you can be taken to the place that God has always wanted you to be. But before we give a message, people need to be accepted. You guys get that? I, I don't know how long I'm going to get, what I'm going to get through today, but I just want to drive this home. Because we're going to reach some people. Let's reach them with the right spirit. See, this story we're reading out is a story that we're going to be reading in, in this Judges. is a story of redemption, not condemnation. So let's read it in John. Look at John 3.17. John 3, 17, God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world. God sent his son into the world, what? Not to judge the world. He didn't send him to judge the world. I mean, he's pronounced final judgment, to pronounce guilty, to sentence, to punishment. You're never going to be really good at being a soul winner if you're super critical about people's lives. And the other thing, you're never going to be a really good soul winner until you're honest about your own life. Because if there's anything good in you, it's because of the grace and goodness of God. You're really good at showing mercy when you realize God's shown me so much mercy. When? Just now, today. You guys understand that? That we're a work in progress. No matter how good you think you're doing, you're still a work in progress. And I'm not saying that we live a sloppy life. It's what we're saying is we live a humble life. We live a life full of mercy. We live a life full of grace so we can help somebody. So the Bible says here that Jesus, that God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Let's remember our message is a salvation message, not a judgmental message. Judge, I mean, the word save means this, to rescue from danger. It means from destruction, from judgment. We're here to rescue people from, from danger, from destruction, from judgment. What, what, what are you talking about? Because a life apart from God is full of danger. A life apart from God is full of destruction. A life apart from God will eventually be judged one day. See, God will judge sin. This is just not the time he's doing it. This is a time that he's saving souls through the good news message that is being brought about through by Christians. You guys, you can pick that up. That's what you get for buying a cheap bracelet. No, I'm just kidding. It just fell off right there for someone. What happened? That's what happened. All right. It means also to me to make well. Someone say to make well. To heal and restore. This is a good message. That right now if you need restoration, Jesus came to restore you. Jesus came to heal you. Jesus came to make you whole. Jesus came to forgive you. Jesus came to set you free. Jesus came to give you eternal life, not to judge you. You know, if you come from any religious background, you're good at judging. You're so good at it. Like you're so good at judging people. Before they do it, you already know they're going to do it. I got a feeling. I could tell the way they're looking. That they're ready to jump into the old, lot, into the old pig pen. I could see it all over there. <laughs> you got to be careful that you're not preaching the wrong message. This is a good news message. That if you've fallen, if you've done the evil in the Lord's sight, which you have, that you no longer need to live under guilt, condemnation, sitting there feeling unworthy. There's a God that sent his son to save you from the consequences of your bad decisions. Now, we're not ignoring that we've done evil. 
And we're not ignoring that we have we've made bad decisions. And we're not ignoring that there's really bad consequences for the bad decisions we've made. What well, we're saying with Christ, all that can turn around. You could start over. You could be saved. You could have eternal life. You could have joy again. You could have peace again. You could dream again. You could move forward. You could make progress. You could pick up all the broken pieces and God could put them all back together again. Give God some praise. He's a restorer. Now, if Jesus didn't judge sinners, neither should we. Be careful you're not that person that everybody's scared to be around. Because you're so critical, you just pick people apart. Like, get away from her, she's, she'll find something on you. <laughs> be that person that actually encourages people. Anybody could be critical, but it takes maturity to build people up. You could tear people down by a look, you could tear people down by a statement. But that's immaturity. Well, that's just the way I am. I just tell the truth. No, you're excusing your lack of tact. You're excusing your lack of love. You're excusing your lack of maturity. Telling the truth and no one's receiving it is not the greatest skill. The greatest skill is telling the truth and people lovingly receiving it. Package it the best way you can so they can understand it and receive it and receive the breakthrough. How many get that? Come on. But let's read this scripture. And this is the whole purpose of reading the scripture. Uh, I'm going to say it again. We will never reach them with a judgmental attitude. How can we judge others? This is a, how can we judge others for the very things we have done? And, and this is the issue. If you become prideful, get ready for a moral failure yourself. I can't believe that they're doing that. Watch out, you'll be doing it soon. Because pride comes before the what? And it's good that you fall in a sense when you're prideful because it gets you back to the square one again, needing the mercy and grace of God. Woo, praise the Lord. Romans 2, 1. Look at the scripture. You may think you can condemn such people. And what we're, trying, what we're doing right now is eliminating all the wrong mindsets. So when we're, when we're reaching them, we're reaching them with, a, with mercy and love and grace that they could feel that you really do care and you really do love them. And that you understand where, they're ca where they came from. You're not there better than them. You are there to serve them. You're not there to look down on them. You're there to pull them up. How many know it's a different mindset? So now, you may think you can condemn such people. But you are just as bad. <laughs> And you have no excuse because you know better. When you say that they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. You're, what he's saying is sometimes we're just better at covering it up with a few hallelujahs and amens. <laughs> it's getting quiet up here. Well, someone committed adultery, I can't believe it. Yeah, you, but you lust at every girl that passes by. What's the difference? Well, I just ain't acting on it. Yes, you are. And you'll never, see, you'll never get right until you admit, man, I, God's working on stuff with, on me too. How many is God still working on stuff with you? Ooh, praise the Lord. We got some honest people in here. God's working on stuff with me. I got issues. I'm not going to share. I have all of them. I know you guys want to know. <laughs> but let's keep going. 
Okay, and we know that God in his justice will punish anyone who does such things. Now, we understand that sin and evil and wrong and adultery and lying and cheating and violence and abuse and all these things eventually will be judged. So don't mistake that. We are saving people from that day of judgment. That day of judgment is serious because once the judgment is made, it's not going to be a two-year sentence, a three-year sentence, a three-month sentence. There's going to be no bail. It's going to be for eternity. But right now, until, until then, God is given a message. You can be saved from future judgment. This is not the time to judge people and pronounce them, to send people to hell. This is a time to let them know that there's good news. Judgment is coming, but forgiveness is here. So when the day of judgment comes, you will not be judged. You will be, you'll be, you'll be redeemed. You'll be forgiven. You'll be in right standing with God. You're going to be okay because you put your faith, not in you. You put your faith in Christ. He's the one that saved you. He's the one that loved you. And God sent his son not to judge you, but came to save you so why not receive the salvation instead of the judgment now there all there are only two results either you reject Christ and his offer of forgiveness mercy and love you can reject Christ his love and mercy and be judged or you can receive his love receive his forgiveness Receive his restoration. Receive right standing with God by placing your faith in Christ. If you place your faith in Christ, you receive a new life. You're forgiven of every one of your sins. You receive the free gift of eternal life. It's not joining a religion. It's actually an experience with God. Jesus himself comes and lives in your heart and makes you a brand new person and fills you with his spirit. And that's called being born again. God doesn't say, fix yourself, come to me. He goes, come to me and I'll make you a brand new person with new desires, with a new life. You can have this life by believing or you can reject this life and be judged. Right now, we're bringing a message of hope, freedom, and new beginnings. But it goes on to say, since you judge others for doing these things, and this is judge, I mean, Romans 2, 3, since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? He goes, so you want to be judging, 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 sending people to hell? You go to hell, you go to hell, to hell with all of you. If you want to do that, the only problem is you're living under law. And what he's saying, basically what you dish out is just going to come back to you. Either we're going to give grace and mercy or we're going to give judgmental condemnation. But he's saying that if you want to judge and condemn people, this is what's going to happen. It's only going to come back to you because what you dish out will come back to you. The measure you're using for others is the measure that's coming back to you. Is that how you want to live? So what's the condition of the people we're reaching? Number one, they did evil in the Lord's sight. Well, that shouldn't be surprised us because we've done evil in the Lord's sight. What was the second condition? I'm just going to end it here. They were having to deal with the consequences of their bad choices. Now, the reason I want to say that is the scripture goes on to say is they did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. Now, wait a second. Did God judge them? No, God didn't judge them. He honored their choice. There's a difference between judgment and consequences. What this means is you can make bad decisions and reap horrible consequences, but be careful that you're not blaming God for your dumb choices. And you're saying, God, why'd you let it happen? And God says, why'd you let it happen? You're the one that made that choice. And now you're reaping the consequences. So when God said he handed them over to the Midianites, he only handed them over to their choice. So why the Midianites? Because when God gave them the land, 
supernatural. That means they went, to, they went to war, they gained this land, and instead of serving God in their blessing, they began to worship the false gods of the Midianites. The, so they abandoned God for pleasure. They abandoned God for lust. They abandoned God for a drug. They abandoned God for a spirit of, a, a spirit of doing whatever I want to do. And uh, they abandoned God. And then God says, is that the choice you're making? Well, yeah. He goes, okay, well, I have to hand you over to your choice. So it's one thing about doing evil, but understand, you could do evil in the Lord's sight. But when we do evil in the Lord's sight, when we live wrong, understand for sure, not maybe, there will be consequences. And when you face consequences, don't blame God. Take personal responsibility because when you take personal responsibility, then you could get right. God is not your problem. God is your answer. You guys got that? Hmm. I want to just read what I wrote here. It says, consequences are, and judgment are two different things. Consequences are not a result of God's judgment, but a result of the choices we've made. We need to be careful that we're not blaming God for the consequences of our bad choices. One of the first steps of getting restored is taking personal responsibility for our life choices. You guys get that? I remember when um, my mother, she, she, my mother got saved in a church in the Virgin Islands, which is really next to, it's close to Puerto Rico, a little island called St. Croix. And there was a young lady, a little Mexican girl that came from Mexico. And she was very young, in her 20s. And she went as a missionary to this little island of St. Croix. And she began, this little girl was knocking on doors. She was going to share her testimony that night in the church. And she was going to do her part to invite as many people as she could. She was the only one knocking on doors from Mexico. The church wasn't knocking on doors. She was. And she wanted to invite as many people as she could. Well, she happened to knock on my mother's door. My mom was just 20-something years old, just graduated from the University of Puerto Rico. She's sitting there. She's seen this young girl right around her age that's going to share her testimony in church. And my mom was just curious. And she said, wow, I got to see this girl share her testimony. It's unbelievable. How could this little girl be able to say anything? So my mom went to church just because she was curious. Well, that day after that young lady shared her testimony, shared her story, my mother ran down the aisle and gave her life to the Lord. Now, after she gave her life to the Lord, my mom was being taught the word of God. And one of the words of God that my mom was taught is not to be unequally yoked. What is... What fellowship has a believer with a non-believer? And all that means is, if you're a believer, do not get involved. I'm talking singles right now. Do not get involved in a relationship to get married with a non-believer. Because you're both going different directions. And it's not going to work. Well, my mother said, you know, I'm good. I I'm good. Um, so she ends up meeting my, my, my dad before, I mean, my dad. And she met my dad, and my dad was a smooth talker, great dancer, loved dancing salsa music. Everybody loved him. Very attractive man, personality, all that. Come from a rich family. Just looked like the perfect catch, but he wasn't because he wasn't a believer. So my mother ends up going, now she's knowing, she, knowingly breaking already the laws of God. She's doing evil 
in God's sight. You know what that means? She's doing it her way, not God's way. So she's now going, now my dad is whining, dining her, making her feel good. They're, they're going to parties and doing all the dancing, blah, 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 blah. everything's good. My family warned her, said, look, do not marry him. He's not a man of God. My mom marries him anyway. On that night when my mom married my dad, he punched her, threw her through a window and beat her just like the Midianites for seven years straight. My mom had black eyes. He punched her. He punched her in the stomach when she was pregnant with me. He put guns to her. He pistol whip her. For seven years, she was a prisoner in a home right on the beach. We live right on the beach and no one know my mom was suffering for seven years as a consequence. It wasn't God. It was her choice. The good news is after all of that, there's redemption. That means right now you might be in consequences of the bad choices you made. And there's people out there that are suffering the consequences of the bad choices they've made. But I got good news for you. Even if you're suffering for consequences that you've made, God has the ability to turn it all around and produce a church like the Way World Outreach out of all that mess. We'll end it with this scripture. In Deuteronomy 30, 19, it says this. Today, today, everyone online here, I'm giving you a choice of two ways. And I ask heaven and earth to be a witness of your choice. You can't leave this room without choice. Either you place your faith in Christ or you don't. Either you take responsibility. Hey, you know what? The, res the, the consequences I'm getting, we're smart enough to know that we're smart enough to know. We don't have to break this down. We already know, man, I made that decision and I'm reaping the consequences. I knew what I was entering in, but I thought I was going to get away with it. I did it anyway, and now I have these consequences. And maybe someone here today needs to stop blaming God and just take personal responsibility so you could get out of the mess. And it says here, you can choose life, or death. The first choice will bring a blessing. The other choice will bring a curse. And you know what's so crazy about this? It's like a multiple choice test and there's only two options, life, death, blessing, cursing. And God is so awesome because he knows sometimes how ignorant we are. He goes, let me give you the answer. Choose life. <laughs> Choose Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Choose this. Choose life. Then you and your children will live. And what he's saying is, in his portion of scripture, we talk about the condition of the ones that we're reaching. And I will say this, the condition of our own souls apart from Christ. One is, we've all done evil in the Lord's sight. We can't judge anybody. We've all been there. And it was God's mercy and love that saved us. God sent his son while we were still in our sin and still in our mess. Because I'm sending my son, not to judge you, but I'm sending my son to save you, make you whole, to forgive you, to set you free, to restore your life, to restore your dreams, to set you free from your addictions, to get rid of that depression that's so deep in your heart, to, to set you free from that spirit of torment and suicide. I want to help you. I want to give you a new start. And then he goes on. What's the second condition? The second condition is they were having to face the consequences of their decisions or choices. And you know what? If you've made a bad choice, you do have another option. You could get off that train that's headed to hell, headed to destruction, headed to nowhere, and say, I'm done riding this crazy train. I'm done. I'm done with addiction. I can't fix myself, but I need some help. I'm done with anger. I'm done with unforgiveness. I'm done with the, the crazy runs that I get on. I'm done with the compromise. I am done. I'm making a choice. Jesus, save me. Make me whole. Forgive me. Set me free. And that's how it happens. That's how your new beginning starts. Let's all stand up. Everybody at home as well. 
If you're saying, Pastor, that's me. And, and I, I, we've all had to make a decision. I remember I grew up in the church and I was a pretty good boy. But I remember I went to Magic Mountain and it was Christian Day at Magic Mountain. Christian Day at Magic Mountain. And I went with the church and when I got there on Christian Day, they had, we all were riding the rides and then they said, but right around noontime, everybody needs to come to this concert and then you can go back to ride rides. And I remember that day, I go, okay, we'll go to the concert. And I wasn't 100% wanting to go to a concert, I wanted to ride the rides. But it was a deal. You come to go to the concert, then you go to, so it was a Christian concert and there was a singer named Carmen that was there and, and he began to sing. And, and then at the end of that, little concert, it was like an hour long at the most, they made a call. Do you want to surrender your life to Jesus? Do you want to be forgiven of your sins? Are you ready to give it all up? And I remember that day, I grew up in a church. I walked down that aisle at 17 years old and I just began to cry and weep and surrender all that day. It was a beautiful day. I'm telling you that story because it's my story. Today could be that day for you. There's some of you that grew up in the church or you've been in church, but you've been living a compromised life. And because of that, there's just consequences of guilt, shame. You feel like you can't get ahead. It's just there in your life. And it's affecting your kids as well. Because you choose life and so your kids will, may live too. Because understand it's, as an adult, Whatever you do affects those who are under your authority. So you could have a secret life of sin, but understand it's not secret in the spiritual realm. It affects your own children. So someone finally has to say, I'm ready to be a man. I'm ready to be a woman and face my consequences. F take responsibility. I need some change. I can't fix me, but Jesus saved me. Or maybe it's time for you to recommit yourself to the Lord. So I'm ready. This is your moment. Buy heads and close your eyes for a second. I'm going to count to three saying, Pastor, that's me. I'm ready to recommit my life to the Lord. I, need, I, make a I want to make a choice today to walk away from the life that's been ruling my life to follow Christ. When I say three, I want you to raise your hand over this building. This is a choice you're making. Make the choice. Jesus made a choice publicly for you. You make a choice publicly for him. Today, viewers, I'm asking you a question. If today were your last day on earth, do you know where you'd spend eternity? I don't know. Well, give your life to Jesus and he'll give you forgiveness and eternal life. He's not here to condemn you. He's here to save you, restore you, make you new. One, when I say three, I want you to raise your hands all this building. Say, I'm ready. I'm ready to commit 100%. Two, and when I say three, I want you to raise your hands all this building. I'm ready to surrender my life. I want eternal life. I want a new, new beginning. I want to be forgiven. When I say three, raise your hands. One, two, three. Raise your hands all this building. One, I see the hand. Two, proud of you. I see the hand. Three over there. Four over there. Five over there. Anybody else? I, way, way back over there. I see some. Way in the back, I see those hands. Right over here. I see some hands over here. Now, this is what I want you to do. Remember we talked about faith and believing without action produces no results. Will you please give me the privilege of praying with you? And this is what I want you to do. I want you to leave your seat. And this is a sign of you leaving your old life in those seats and starting a new life. And I want you to come up here and I just want to pray with you just for one minute. Let's give them a hand as they're coming up. Come on, church. Let's celebrate one coming to Jesus. Come on, let's celebrate. Let's give them a hand. Come on, someone's making a decision. I'm done my old life. I want to follow Jesus. I made this decision myself. Come on, church. Ask your neighbor. You want to go up there? I'll go up there with you. Brand new start. Brand new beginning. You come with your pain. You come with your hurt. You come with your failures. God's not here to judge you. He's here to forgive you. He's here to save you. I'm proud of every single one of you that are here. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two people at least up here. 
Someone else is coming. Are you coming up, honey? 23 here. Awesome. And we're going to pray right now, but I want you to get this. You're receiving the mercy of God. The love of God. Okay? You're not here to prove nothing to Him. He loves you. It's time to get cleansed. You're walking around with too much guilt and shame. And what happens when we walk around that guilt and shame, it makes you careless. Like, I don't care. It makes you feel worthless. And then you make decisions that are like, why are you doing that decision? And you feel, and you feel like you just get in a cycle. It's going down, 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 down. Joy is gone. Your confidence is gone. Your peace is gone. And you start thinking, am I going to live this for the rest of my life? And God said, no, you're not. I love you. And that's why I brought you here today. We've all done evil. Who hasn't? Today's your day to be forgiven and forgive yourself and start a new life following Jesus Christ. Are you ready to follow Jesus? Are you ready to make a choice to place your faith in Jesus and walk away from your sin life? Are you ready to do that? We're going to pray right now. Bow your heads, close your eyes, repeat after me. Say, Jesus, forgive me for all my sins. I believe that you loved me so much that you died on the cross and resurrected from the dead to pay the price for the wrong I've done. Today, I receive forgiveness, love, freedom. Cleanse me, Lord, of all sin. Make me new. I open my heart, Jesus. Fill me now with your spirit. I'm a new person from this day forward. Jesus, I make a choice to make you the Lord of my life. Thank you, Lord, for not giving up on me. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Come on. Reaching one for 2021. We're reaching a lot more than one. 23 today. God bless you.